Welcome to another session as a part of the Digital Innovation Incubator. Uh, today, uh, we have the privilege to talk and have a short discussion uh, with Daniela Laureiro Martinez from ETH uh, Zurich. Hello, Daniela. How are you? Hello, Philippe. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm impressed how well you pronounce my name. Thank you for that. <laughs> and it is a pleasure to be here. I I am very happy about what you guys are doing in this platform, and it's a uh, an honor to be joining you, and I hope this can be useful. Uh, so uh, for the first part, can you please uh, just share some insights about uh, what is it that uh, you do and some you know, personal info about yourself? OK, um, so I work at ETH Zurich. It is a big university here in Switzerland. We are the biggest university, and uh, we are, for the most part, focused on topics around science, technology, mathematics. And I work at the management and economics department and I lead a group of researchers that is called the CoLab. It stands for Cognition, Learning and Adaptive Behavior. So it's very relevant for what we are going to be discussing today. We do research on topics related to connecting how the mind works. So how do individuals think, how they process information and how that makes them more or less adaptive to the environments in which they live and in which they operate. Since we are in a management group, we study leaders, how those people actually are able to adjust to what is happening in the environment and how they help others um, change their behaviors, change their strategies to keep innovating and to keep adjusting to what is happening outside. That is what we do in our group. We are part in a, of a broader group of technology and innovation management and other people in our group, they focus more on the technical aspects of innovation on ecosystems and on like the broader aspect. And what we do in our group and where we are going to discuss today is more at the individual level, uh, try to understand our thinking and some key decisions that we have to make. Uh, so perfect. Uh, I would like to start off uh, with the, the question uh, at the individual uh, level, as, as you mentioned, uh, talking about the exploitation and exploration. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? You had a lot of work done in that area. So just to clarify it and get introduced in that level. So mm -hmm. what is it uh, in that sense? Yeah, so what is exploration and exploitation is two types of behavior that capture what is, in my opinion and in the opinion of many experts, the most important dilemma that we face. And it might sound like an exaggeration, but I honestly think that it's not an exaggeration. I think most of our decisions, particularly the important decisions, usually involve this exploration exploitation. So what are they really? Exploration refers to the type of behaviors where we do not know what is going to be the outcome, where we do not know what is the value that the outcome is going to give us. Mm. For example, let's take a simple example, hopefully a nice example for many, that is you want to eat ice cream and you don't know if you want to choose a new flavor of ice cream or if you want to stick to a known favorite. So exploration would be going for a new flavor of ice cream or even going for a new shop to choose your ice cream. Uh, but let's keep it simple. Let's say that I only have one shop in my little town and I have to go there for my ice cream and exploration would be, do I get strawberry as I've always do, done or should I choose a new flavor that seems very interesting but I am afraid it might not work that is, let's say, chicken wings ice cream. Exploration would be that. Should I explore the unknown? I'm not sure if it's going to be good or if it might actually be quite disgusting. Exploitation, the opposite behavior, would be instead sticking to what is known. And in this example would be, I choose a strawberry. I've always eaten strawberry for the past 40 years, so I'm going to keep it in strawberry. 
or no, I will choose this one and perhaps I actually discover that it's better. So when I discover the outcome, I update my knowledge and then I face the decision differently the next time. Balancing how much exploration and how much exploitation to do is a critical thing. And people who do that will actually get the best of the two types of behaviors because they know to what extent they can explore, how much they can tolerate that uncertainty that comes with exploration and how much they actually get more value from exploiting what they like. So I think it's a, I, I put the example of the ice cream, but it applies to many other realms in our lives. It applies to what career path to choose, something that perhaps is relevant for our audience. Do I keep investing on the topic, on the subject that I've been investing and become even more of a specialist? Do I exploit this or do I explore an alternative? And each one comes with their own risks, right? Uh, the risks of exploitation are that we might be missing out something that is potentially better. So I say, go back to ice cream, I keep eating strawberry, it's very good, I'm very happy, but I, may be, I might be missing out on chicken wings or on Swiss chocolate or whatever, versus I do too much of exploration. So I go for chicken wings and it turns out to not be so good. And then I go for Swiss chocolate and it's actually, it's very good, but it's not as good as strawberry. And on a career realm, the stakes are going to be higher. So it really is a fundamental dilemma in many aspects of our lives. So, uh, I mean, in that respect, it's a type of behavior, as you mentioned. Uh, what seems to be more natural for us humans? You know, do we more uh, tend to think or behave in an exploitative way or explorative, or explorative way? And why? Do we have any insights? So so you are touching on a super important point, and there is not a single answer that we say, hey, humans really tend to only explore or humans tend to only exploit. It's actually depending, obviously, a lot on inter-individual preferences, but we tend to, by nature, we tend to have a tendency to know when to do one or the other. However, different aspects more from the environment led us into a more exploitative path or a more explorative path. I would dare to say that in, the, in many cases, we tend to go a bit more exploitative because the forces around us tend us to put from very early on in our lives into more exploitative modes. But obviously there are many examples that are the opposite of what I just said, right? Like people that throughout their lives, they keep exploring and they maybe do little exploitation to capture the value of what they are doing. Let's go back to a career choice example. If I started studying, um, say, medicine, and I did a bit of that, but before I actually became very good, I go and turn into an ice cream chef. And before I really become very good at that, I go and turn into something else. I will never really capture the gains. I will never really capture the value of what I have invested my exploration time. And that can happen in many, in many things. So I don't think there is like a unique answer, but there are many forces that make us tend more towards exploitation. And uh, one decisive aspect, let's say two main aspects here that help are one, the risk aversion. So we are risk averse by nature, most of us, and that makes us tend more for exploitation. But we are also very curious creatures. And that makes us naturally tend more for exploration. To what extent one is more or the other, it varies according to person, to each person, but also according to the context. I am very explorative in the kitchen, but I am very exploitative when it comes to investment. I am very explorative when I paint. I don't care, it's horrible, I don't mind, and it's just for fun, and I try new materials and new colors and things but I am very exploitative when it comes to make decisions about the education of my kid. And I think depending on the context, I can notice myself that I'm more or less explorative because I guess I 
have more freedom in losing in having a bad outcome from what I'm doing or I don't even for example in my example of the painting I don't even care about the outcome you know so I think it really varies according to these aspects how risk averse or risk prone we are and how much space we leave to our own curiosity that we all have it as a tendency uh, so you mentioned before earlier a little bit about the balancing the ability to balance both exploitation mm -hmm. and exploration mm -hmm. So uh, there's a concept uh, about the ambidextrous leaders, creative leaders, and the ambidexterity in general. Uh, could you explain uh, what that is and you know, what does it mean to be a creative leader, innovative leader, and an ambidextrous leader? Yes, definitely. We have a concept in management that is called ambidexterity. So ambidexterity means with both hands, and uh, it comes from the idea that one can do things right using these two behaviors. So one can be at the same time exploratory and exploitative. So one can create novelty, look for new ways to do things, new alternatives, new ice cream flavors. And on the other hand, one can also reap the gains of what one has done and um, refine the choices that one has made in the past and learn from them. And we can do these two things. And by doing that, we are more likely to get the value of the exploration we do. And as such, it makes us a lot more creative because we have also the forces to invest into creativity. I think a misconception about creativity is that it's like the genius, painting, and uh, I don't know, the totally um, hippie style of the creative person that has really extreme ideas and comes up with this novelty. And I think it's overemphasizing the novelty aspect of creativity. Both in the concept of dexterity and in the concept of creativity, we have two sides. So also in creativity, we have a side that is, yes, of course, novelty, but we have also a side that is usefulness, how useful a new idea is, how useful a new product is. That makes it creative, that it's novel and that it's useful. And in the case of ambidextrous leaders, these are people that know when to switch to explore and say, hey, 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 no, now we cannot continue doing the same. We need to look for a new market or for a new idea. And at the same time, get the value out of those new ideas, not only go crazy new ideas all the time and never sit down and exploit those ideas. So these are the two sides from exploration and exploitation within these two concepts, ambidexterity and creativity. Uh, when you talk about it this way, maybe it some, sounds a little bit tough for people, you know, can I really uh, do this? So can we go into detail as to uh, what types of thinking uh, does it involve? Like what, what do you have to do? What parts of your brain uh, should you get going in order to engage? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I am very happy to talk about that. And that has to do with the research that my team and I have been doing over the past 13, 14 years actually. And it is research that tries to understand what do experienced decision makers, experienced leaders, what cognitive abilities, let's say, do they have when they face these dilemmas, when they face exploration, exploitation dilemmas? So over the past 14 years, we have embarked into several different projects and we have gone from case studies of organizations, successful organizations that manage to do multiple goals and multiple behaviors, case studies, interviews, surveys, tests all the way to study their brains using fMRI methods. fMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. So we image the brain as it is functioning. And we try to use this method to approximate what cognitive abilities are more likely to be in use when people are managing these dilemmas. And then of course we triangulate with the other methods that I mentioned. So that we have a fuller picture, not only when the manager is inside an fMRI, but also when the manager is making other decisions in a broader context. What we find 
in more than one study, so it gives us trust that we are capturing something meaningful here, is that an, a very important ability to manage this dilemma is called cognitive flexibility. Cognitive flexibility is our ability, our skill, to switch our thinking modes according to the situation that we are facing. It is a super fundamental ability because it really makes us behave in an appropriate manner depending on the context. People who are very, very low in cognitive flexibility, they tend to show obsessive behaviors. They tend to show maladaptive behaviors. And I think we have to stop for a second because my <laughs> thing is starting to sound again. Sorry. No, it's it's not. We can we can wait a bit, sorry. <laughs> Usually it doesn't go twice in a day, but today yeah. you want today to participate. It's, yeah. Uh, it's very it, cold it, it, outside. It might be that. It's like minus four outside. And it was but yeah. Uh, is it okay with you uh, if I repeat the question? Yeah, I think we have to. Yeah. <laughs> but let's wait because it's really loud now. And I don't have a way to stop it. Yeah. Uh, what is it? The noise is very loud. So I. No, no, no. What What is the sound? Ah, uh, you don't hear it? It's the heating. Ah, uh, it's the heating. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so when the heating goes, uh, I think it blows harder at some points in the day and then it makes this noise. And usually it just does it once a day, but I think it's very cold outside today. So yeah. it's just. Uh... Yeah, I think it stopped. Yeah, it stopped. Yeah, I have, I have a few, I have a little bit more of time. Uh, if, if okay, I hope that you have a bit more time too, so we can continue because I just realized it's four already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay with me. Yeah, okay. I've, uh, you know, uh, put some extra time. Uh, okay, good. Because I okay. thought we were going to talk okay. about all okay. the things. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm just going to repeat the question and then mm -hmm. we can uh, move from there. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. So it seems to me that, you know, a lot of people can maybe think that it's hard to do uh, all of that stuff. So what type of thinking does it involve? You know, what, what can we do in that respect uh, to engage ourselves? Yeah, so that is a very good question. And um, that is at the core of what our research group has been doing in the past 14 years. We have covered a variety of methods to try to understand how leaders actually deal with this dilemma, how leaders manage ambidexterity. And to do so, we have investigated cases in companies, we have done retrospective data analysis of what has happened to companies, how were the leaders, we have interviewed many of them, we have also done surveys, and more interestingly, for the purposes of today, we have done studies um, to capture their brain processes, their cognitive functioning. For that, we use something called fMRI. FMRI stands for Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. It is a method that allows us to proxy what is going on in the head of these people as they make decisions and as they solve problems. What we have observed in these different methods is that there is one fundamental ability that seems to help people to, do, to be more ambidextrous. And that ability is called cognitive flexibility. Now, cognitive flexibility is something that we all have. So that is good news. We all have, well, unless one is like extremely, extremely unlucky, one doesn't have cognitive flexibility, but one would know that already. But generally, all humans have this ability. We are born with a little bit of that and we develop it as we grow. When we reach maturity around 21, 23 years old, it gets at its peak and then it starts to slowly decline. There are ways to stop its declining too fast, but we can talk about that another time. Now, what is super important about this ability is that it can be trained. And one of the core ways to train it, and this is very nascent research in other groups and also in our group, but one of the core ways to train it is actually by activating something called metacognition. 
Um, some of you might be familiar with that term. Metacognition refers to the ability to oversee, to sort of be aware of what are our own cognitive processes. What am I thinking about? How am I thinking in this moment? It sounds more complicated than it is, but let's say in practice, let's go back to our initial ice cream example. I enter the ice cream place and I realize that I am on automatic mode, that I enter and I look at the thing and instead of actually looking at what flavors are there, I go immediately and I know that I like strawberry, so I go for strawberry. Metacognition would be to have like a an imaginary supervisor here in our heads that enters with us the shop and says like, hmm, you are in automatic mode. You are about to choose what you've always done before. Is that still okay? Or should you switch to explore something good? And then you have this internal dialogue without going crazy. You don't have to vocalize that when you're in the ice cream place, but you have like a quick internal check where you say like, should I stay or should I go? Should I stick to what I've done in the past or should I choose something new? That is a simple activity that is happening. In many cases, it's happening without us noticing, but in many cases, we just go the auto automatic way without noticing, right? And again, in the ice cream example, it doesn't really matter, but with many other choices, it might matter, right? Let's say that I am... Um, I... I am, let's say I have a certain health problem. I shouldn't be consuming so much salt. My blood pressure goes to the stars and I automatically open my shelf and I take a big, large package of chips. They are super gratifying, but they are gonna cause me a problem. And I do this automatically day after day. Metacognition would be, okay, is this serving me or should I change for something else? Another level would be, should I stick to this or should I have in the same place something a little bit healthier next time? This activating, this metacognition is a way to train our cognitive flexibility because it allows us to be more observant of our own thinking and decide if that's the right type of thinking or not. Uh, so, I mean, not just going to be uh, a bit too much technical, but uh, what parts of the brain are actually mostly involved uh, in that sense, just to go a little bit in that sense, just to understand how yeah. complex uh, this thing issue is and how can we maybe manage uh, yeah. that or counter what we like to talk about, this innate non-creativity of our brain. So I'm actually very happy to go technically. And if you want, I can show an image. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. So I can show an image of what is going on in our heads when we do exploitation and what is going on in our head when we do exploration. Yeah. Let me just play it here. So this image here shows the main regions of our brain and as such, the proxy of the cognitive processes that are taking place when we explore, when we exploit, sorry. This image here is about exploitation. What is it telling us? Um, it's a heat map, basically. So it's a statistical map. This is not our brain lighting. This is just how much activation do we think that is in certain regions of the brain. And what we see is that there are some areas that are related to the perception of rewards, meaning how much value am I getting from the choice that I am making? So let's imagine this person is doing exploitation, is eating strawberry ice cream, is getting a lot of reward from that alternative. It's a good alternative. It's also memorizing. So what is happening when you are having exploitation, you are also memorizing, you are also activating areas that are associated with persistence. So how much, I do a behavior again and again when it's fruitful to do it. And what we understand from this whole series of activations is that people are really learning. So exploitation is not a passive activity. Good exploitation is happening when people are learning from the outcomes that they are getting. We see something very different in contrast when people are exploring. When they are exploring, what we observe is that the areas that are associated with attention control 
are very active, and this has to do with this metacognition I was referring to before. Metacognition meaning I am aware of my own processes and I'm deciding if I shift my attention. Should I have a broader way of thinking? Should I take more alternatives into account? Should I look around the ice cream place? Or should I be more narrow and focused? This is happening when people are turning to explore, when they are about to start exploring. And they are also activating areas that are associated with planning planning future actions, and also generating ideas. So this gives us a contrasting picture of very two different types of processing happening here. Now, I can also interpret your question one level higher up. Let's say, what is actually helping people switch between these two behaviors? And what we see is that it's the attention control region. So it's really reshifting the attention, reallocating my mental powers, to say, will I do something new or will I stick? That is why it's helping do the right switch. How do we know that? Because we have done studies where we actually try to correlate people who perform better, so people who are better at doing this switch, and we try to see what is it that they have different from the others, and we see this attention control. Did I, did I answer your question on that? Yes, 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 of okay. course. Uh, now I would like to just uh, to focus on those people that are, you know, doing those ambidextrous leaders, those creative mm -hmm. leaders, because, you know, uh, through Digital Innovation Incubator, we are focusing on developing the next yeah. generation and, you know, uh, future leaders and talents. So how do these people approach, let's say, decision making and problem solving? Because basically, uh, you know, in developing innovative solutions and yeah. developing innovation projects, there's going to be a lot, you know, yeah. decision making and uh, uh, problem solving in that sense. So, how do is the best way, or is there a best way to approach this kind of stuff? So, we can I can answer you here at two levels. One is something that I observe in leaders that are very good at doing at being ambidextrous, let's say, um, and the other one is what we what the theory would tell us, let's say. So one is more from, a, from an observational point of view, what do I see that these leaders are characterized by? And the other one is more how would the, what would the theory tell me? What are like the protocols of how to do this well? And then I can try and connect the two. So let me start first with what do I observe? What I see in, I would say, all the cases of ambidextrous leaders, this is not a matter of luck. We are not talking here about the person that does one good discovery and they become millionaires and they move on. That can be talent, of course, there is usually a lot of talent behind, but it's not the repetitive, successful that we are looking for to understand in our studies. In our studies, in our lab, what we're trying to do is to understand what makes somebody really adaptive. And to be really adaptive, it cannot be just one hit and go. What we see in those people that instead do it again and again, that the environment changes and they still launch a useful product, the environment changes and they still manage to recreate their company or they close that company and create a new one. What they really tend to have is that they have a huge level of self-awareness. It is something extremely important from a cognitive point of view. These people are aware of how they think and that helps them surround themselves with people that might be complementary. So if they know that they are really good at generating ideas, exploring new things, they love novelty, they are aware that they sometimes have to stop and think if they shouldn't be exploiting. Or they are also aware that they might need to complement themselves with people that are more in the exploitative way, let's say. And you can use these two simple techniques, right? Like you, well, it's not so simple to be aware of your own way, but that helps you already to say, hey, I know that I am always looking for novelty. I'm really good at starting things, but I'm not really good at closing them. I have to do that. But it also helps you to say, maybe I don't do that. I specialize on throwing ideas and I surround myself with people who are good executors. That is one thing that I would say is common to all good leaders. And we are talking from, 
founders of multi-billion companies to small startups, they all, all those that we study that are able to adapt again and again, have that ability. They are, I wouldn't say they are the explorer type or the exploitative type. They are both types or some of them are really both, but they know how to surround themselves and they know how to balance this. That's one part. Now, on what the science behind would tell us how to train to become more ambidextrous, there are like four critical components behind ambidexterity. And now is the time that one takes paper and pencil because it can get a little bit technical, but I'll try to break it down simply. Four components. One is attention. The second one is something called working memory. The third one is something called inhibition. And the fourth one is something called switching. These are four processes at the mental level that allow us to capture the complexity of a problem, break it down, and decide if we want to continue doing the same or not. These are four components behind cognitive flexibility. Now, let me explain one second each of them, and then if you want to go deeper, we can, or if not, we move on. What do we mean when we say attention helps you do exploration, exploitation better? We mean that by refocusing your attention, you are better able to decide, hey, I'm, I'm being too narrow here. It's been really long that I stick to this project and it doesn't work. Maybe it's really time to broaden up and get some new perspectives in. And that could mean do something different. That could mean hire somebody else. That could mean present it to a different audience to get new ideas. That could mean many things, but it has to do with broadening or narrowing your attention. It could also be the opposite. I gave an example of narrow attention, but it can also be, hey, I am all over the place here. This is not working. I maybe need to narrow and just focus on one aspect to work it out and then move on. That is the first component, attention. The second component is called working memory. It's a word that is a term that is used also in computer science to refer to how much capacity you have to hold things in mind at a certain time. So in our case, it would mean, in my example of my project that is not working well, would mean I am being really focused here. I need to enlarge my set of possibilities and I need to hold multiple perspectives in mind. This is critical and super difficult for many managers to do because they are usually successful in their own ways of thinking. And this working memory will require that you switch perspectives, that you bring new ideas into mind, that you take the perspective of somebody else, for example, and see things from their point of view. You take the perspective of not the usual customer that you have in mind, but something completely different. It requires techniques of creativity, and it connects to the third component that is inhibition. Inhibition is again difficult for many to do because it's counterintuitive in a way. You've been doing something, your first answer is certain answer, and then it asks you to stop, think twice, take a step back, and start again. Um, it's hard to do, but it's super powerful. Sometimes really before making a decision, if the managers stop and think twice and really that don't go immediately with what they were thinking it was the right thing, but just give those few seconds. It doesn't look like much, but the brain works super fast and it can make a lot of difference. So that's inhibition. And then the last one is if everything else tells you to switch, then the last one is there to switch. And it can be in many cases that actually the good thing is to not switch. That can be, of course, a good alternative, but at least you get there in a different manner. So these are the four components. Attention control, the first one. You broaden or you narrow, depending on what you think is helping you in that moment. Working memory, you really bring many perspectives. You enrich your view with different alternatives. Inhibition, you really don't block them. Many people generate alternatives, but they kill them right away. And that happens a lot. You generate instead and you don't block them. You hold them there. You inhibit the impulse to kill them. And then you decide if you have to switch or not. I don't know if that got too confusing or too long as an answer. I hope that helps. No, I, I think it's going to be extremely useful in order 
uh, for you know each and every one of us uh, to learn how we can approach. Uh, yes. we, we've been doing this with um, executives that we work with. Um, these are extremely successful people uh, in their business. Um, I would say generally in their lives, but that's maybe too much to say, but they are definitely very successful business people. And uh, we, we ask them to come with a real life problem. It can be from their personal life or it can be from their professional life. Problems are very different. It, com it can be from, I don't have time to do the important things in my job. I do not have time to innovate because I'm always pressed by meetings, agenda, etc. cetera. To, I have communi uh, communication difficulties with somebody in my team. It, it can be anything. And we give them the same four steps, this attention, working memory, inhibition, and switching. And it sounds like something a bit abstract, but if you take your problem and you try to break it apart and you say, hey, should I go broader or should I go narrower? Let me take different perspectives in mind. Let me actually consider them, give them a chance before blocking them. And now I decide if I should switch strategy or not. It, it is for abilities, let's say, and they connect. Now, let me do the last step I wanted to do that is try to connect this with the idea of metacognition. I started saying that really good leaders that I've seen, they share in common this trait. They are super self-aware. They are aware of, it's not awareness of how do I look or I'm a short woman and I have short hair. It's not awareness in that sense, but it's internal awareness. It's my strengths, my weaknesses. I think that if one wants to achieve that, I think these four steps that I mentioned before, I think they lead, they are conducive to something like that. Because people, if you do this again and again with your own problems, you start noticing that actually you tend to be on a narrow attention, or you start noticing that you tend to be on a very broad attention mode. And by doing that, you gain more self-awareness, let's say. You gain more of this understanding of, ah, okay, this is what helps me. I tend to jump to a first solution that comes to my head, and then I really marry that solution and never let it go and defend it, even if it's not good. You start realizing all of these things, and then that helps you, well, choose the good job that fits you, choose where you can add value, and also choose who can you work with either as you creating your own team or what team you can choose, right? If you are a person that is always shooting ideas, you'd better not go work with somebody like that because both of you shooting ideas, I don't think that's going to be a really good combination, right? Yeah, nobody is going to see things through. No, but it's going to actually execute the stuff, exactly. Or, or yes, you go and work with somebody like that, but then you make sure that you have a really good team that executes for you. And, and I think that awareness is, is something fundamental if one wants to, to balance this exploration exploitation. So, so we know basically now what we have to do. Uh, and all of that path, uh, I think, and uh, based on everything that you do, that we have uh, you know, a large amount, numerous biases that we encounter. So it's going to get hard along the way. Could we just a little bit uh, in the end focus a little bit about that? So what are the most common uh, biases that everybody uh, is going to in encounter on that path and maybe okay. how to minimize their effect? Um, yes, so the list of biases is ridiculously extensive and many of those biases can affect these fundamental behaviors of exploration exploitation because precisely I would say maybe top five or top three okay the most um, common um, ones that you observe so i would say the i would even go to top two the the two toughest ones that we see people suffer from when deciding whether to explore and exploit and one is novelty seeking and the other one is fear of change now, novelty seeking leads to overexploration. People who love novelty, they get a burst of energy from engaging into new things. Most of us do, but some of us really get a huge burst of energy of doing something new. Can be a bad movie, but it's new. So it's better than a good old movie. 
can be a bad new boyfriend, but it's new. It's better than the no one. Some people really go over exploratory. And uh, what can one do about that? Again, the first thing is that you are aware of it and that you decide if it's really worth it the change of not. I think there are some tests to measure your novelty seeking or your, um, yeah, your. it has to do with curiosity, but it's really about this burst of energy, this drive to explore new alternatives. So that is, I would say, the top one for over-exploration. And then on the other side, this fear of novelty or the fear of change, it's really something that we see that is people get attached to the outcomes that they are having ice cream example is i just don't know something better than strawberry and i'm happy with strawberry which is a good thing but i might be missing out and i have this fear of change what can we do for that one i think of course awareness helps in that case as in all cases but in that one i think many people can start exploring things novelty in small bits so where you are not going to lose too much just to get like the ability to explore and the fear to, to get a taste of how body feels to lose how body feels to change so many psychologists recommend to find a realm where we, you wouldn't lose too much and start doing some exploration in that realm with where you know that even if you lose, even in the worst case scenario, you know it's not going to be so bad. So actually risking those senses and then see, OK, that was the worst case scenario. It's not so bad. I can take something else. Uh, can we go and try chicken wing ice cream? It can be go and try something that you know is not going to be the end of the world just to get that fear of change lower. And by doing that, one can then maybe risk and do something in a bigger, in a bigger realm. So uh, to conclude, uh, do you have maybe uh, any last messages or key points? Because uh, all of us are going to be working on creating and developing, you know, innovative solutions, innovative projects uh, to, to, to focus on solving problems at the industry market, market and company level. Mm -hmm. So any uh, last maybe piece of advice on what to focus on, on what to maybe uh, adjust in their approach on who do you want to surround yourself with in this process of developing something innovative and yeah. creative. So I think, I think something useful for the projects that you all are going to be doing, but particularly as a start of being better at doing this exploration exploitation, I think starting by observing some decisions every day and breaking them down, trying to understand why did I choose that? That is a way to exercise this metacognition muscle. It's not really a muscle, but it's this ability that the more you exercise it, the more natural it becomes to use it. So one small homework, let's say, that one could do is observe how okay I, I love food so my examples tend to be about food but let's observe how you choose what to have for dinner when you're cooking at home and how happy you are about it right the how happy or how satisfied would be the value of this project and the observation of how you made the decision to do that is starting to help you train this metacognition so how do I go about what am I gonna put in? Am I gonna go exactly a usual recipe as the book told me and I know it by heart? Or am I gonna deviate and improvise because I don't have a certain ingredient? Or I go out and I'm gonna have dinner out or I'm gonna have lunch out. How do I go about my decision? And it can be also with more fundamental decisions, right? Like I have a serious disease. How do I go about my treatment? Do I go the usual way or do I go a different way? or I am having an existential crisis, I'm choosing if I'm gonna change career, or if I'm gonna choose something different to study, try to break down how you face those decisions. That could be a really good homework to help you prepare the moment you are actually running your innovative project, you understand better what is making you choose the way you're doing. And just by understanding that better, chances are you're gonna do it better already. 
it's not because there is any magic in, oh, you understand it better, so you end up doing it better. No, it's because if you understand it better, you are more deliberate in your way of doing things. And by doing that, you are way more likely to choose a better balance, a better way of deciding. You are more likely to spend the right amount of time in exploration, the right amount of time in exploitation. You are more likely to surround yourself with the right team or even define the good roles for different people in your team. So I, I would say practicing this on a daily basis, I think that is a good exercise. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, this discussion, talking about all this stuff. I, th I think it's going to be super useful. Uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, hope to see you soon in Croatia. Thank you, Philip. Yes, I hope the same. And thanks for everyone. I hope it was of use. I hope it is of interest. And uh, let me know if I can be of any further help. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.